Our health is dictated by a combination of many factors. Some health conditions have a well-understood genetic cause. Often it's a single genetic variant and a single gene. For these monogenic conditions, like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and Huntington disease, a genetic test often gives a clear answer. Yes, a disease-causing variant is identified, or no, it's not. For most other health conditions, such as heart diseases, cancers, and mental illness, the cause is usually more complicated and likely includes multiple genetic factors, the environment, and a person's lifestyle and demographics. Conditions impacted by multiple factors, including genetics, are called complex or multifactorial conditions. And conditions that are impacted by many genetic factors are called polygenic conditions. The term polygenic means that hundreds to thousands of genetic variants may influence the condition. Each variant usually has a very small effect, although some variants can have a larger effect. The additive effect of these variants can have significant impact on a person's chances for developing the health condition. Can genetic testing be used to measure polygenic risk for a health condition? The answer is yes. After decades of genetic testing for monogenic conditions, new technologies now allow us to use genetic testing to estimate a person's risk for polygenic conditions. Before we discuss how genetic testing works, let's learn about two key concepts for understanding how these conditions are inherited, called complex or multifactorial inheritance, and how genetics plays a role in a person's likelihood for developing a health condition. These concepts are heritability and genetic liability. Let's start with heritability. Heritability measures how much the variability or difference from person to person in a health condition at a population level is explained by genetics. Our understanding of heritability comes mostly from twin studies. By comparing a health condition in identical twins who share all their DNA versus fraternal twins who share half their DNA, just like ordinary siblings, researchers can calculate heritability. This provides insight into how much genetics influences the condition. Heritability is a number ranging from 0 to 1. A value close to 1 means almost all the variability seen in a condition is due to genetic factors. A value close to 0 means almost all the variability seen in a condition is due to non-genetic factors. Next, let's talk about genetic liability, also called genetic load. Overall disease liability is a way to understand the cumulative impact on a person's disease risk from polygenic and non-genetic factors. Genetic liability is a portion of the person's disease risk that is due to polygenic factors. The higher the liability in a group of people or family, the greater the likelihood that people in that group or family will develop the condition. Liability can't be measured directly. It's a theoretical way to describe how some people have a higher risk than others, and the people with the highest risk are the ones who develop the condition. The distribution of liability in a population follows a standard distribution or bell-shaped curve. People on the left side of the curve have the lowest liability, whereas people on the right side of the curve have the highest liability. We can define a liability threshold, the point where someone has enough liability to either have or be at increased risk for the health condition. Knowing that families share similar genetic liabilities, how do we determine the risk to other family members when a complex condition is already present in a family? Clinicians currently use empiric risks to answer these questions. Empiric risks are estimated by studying large numbers of families with the same condition. For example, a study looking at one parent with bipolar disorder and their children might show that 1 in 12, or approximately 8%, of children also develop bipolar disorder. Using this information, a patient with bipolar disorder who wants to know the chances for their children would be told each one has approximately a 1 in 12 chance of developing it as well. This assessment of risk is a one-size-fits-all approach and does not take into account any specific information about the patient or their family. More recently, researchers have estimated genetic liability using data from Genome-Wide Association Studies, or GWAS. These studies examine large genetic data sets looking for the hundreds to thousands of variants spread across the genome that are found more frequently in people with a specific health condition, the cases, compared to people without the condition, the controls. From here, researchers use statistical methods to combine all of those variants and their effect sizes into a polygenic risk score, sometimes shortened to polygenic score. 
Polygenic risk scores represent more personalized estimates of a person's risk for complex conditions than empiric risks. A person's polygenic risk score depends on the number of risk-associated genetic variants they carry and on how much each variant contributes to the risk. Polygenic risk scores represent disease risk due to genetics, and they can be combined with other factors such as sex, race and ethnicity, lifestyle, and environment to further personalize an overall risk assessment. Polygenic risk scores can be used as a population screening tool to identify people at increased risk for complex conditions who might benefit from tailored approaches to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Published reports show that polygenic risk scores improve accuracy in identifying people at increased risk for conditions like coronary artery disease and prostate cancer. And there is evidence that awareness of polygenic risk scores and increased risk motivates people to make positive changes to their health behavior. Polygenic risk scores also show promise in helping clinicians make a diagnosis, predict prognosis, make treatment decisions, predict disease age of onset, and further stratify risks for those already in high-risk categories. For example, studies show that polygenic risk scores for coronary artery disease can help guide the initiation of statin therapy in younger adults. In some cases, a very high polygenic risk score can confer as much risk for a condition as a monogenic risk variant for that condition. Although the clinical use of polygenic risk scores is still in its early stages, these scores are a valuable tool in precision medicine and have the potential to significantly impact healthcare. As polygenic risk scores are incorporated into patient care, it's important to understand how they are reported. Polygenic risk scores can be reported as relative risk, absolute risk, or percentile rank. All represent valid ways to report scores. However, each describes risk in a different way. Relative risk compares the risk between two groups. In the case of polygenic risk scores, relative risks typically compare people with a given polygenic risk score to the population average. A relative risk of 1 means based on genetics, a person has an average likelihood for developing the condition. A relative risk of 1.7 means a person's likelihood is 1.7 times greater than average. Likewise, a relative risk of 3 means a person's likelihood is 3 times greater than average. Absolute risk describes the risk a person carries over a specified time period, such as 10 years or over their lifetime. For example, an absolute lifetime risk of 43% means a person has a 43% or 43 chances out of 100 likelihood of developing the condition in their lifetime. A score of 18% means a person has an 18% chance of developing or an 82% chance of not developing the condition in their lifetime. Whether or not an absolute risk represents an increased relative risk depends on other known factors about the condition, such as its prevalence in the population. Percentile rank compares a person's polygenic risk score to the distribution of scores within a population. A person at the 75th percentile has a score as high or higher than 75% of the people in that population. A percentile rank of 9% means a person's score is as high or higher than 9% of the people in that population. It also means their score is lower than 91% of the population. Generally, absolute risks are more easily understood since they provide the actual likelihood of the condition occurring and a time frame for disease onset. Relative risks can be misinterpreted, especially if the prevalence of the condition is low. For example, if a condition is only seen in one patient per thousand, then even a patient with 10 times the average likelihood has only a 1% chance of developing the condition. Percentile rank does not provide information about the magnitude of the risk. Regardless of how a polygenic risk score is reported, it's important for results to be contextualized so that patients understand what their genetic risk actually means for them, as well as the relative contribution of polygenic risk, monogenic risk, lifestyle, clinical, and other risk factors. Because polygenic risk scores are a relatively new technology, we are still learning how they complement other types of risk assessment, like family health history. Clinical adoption of new technologies, such as polygenic risk scores, evolves over time as evidence and experience are gathered to help develop practice guidelines and standards for care. Polygenic risk scores for complex conditions are mostly available to consumers through direct-to-consumer or DTC genetic testing. 
Healthcare professionals are likely to encounter questions about polygenic risk scores from patients who have done DTC genetic testing. A patient's genetic risk should be considered within the context of their overall clinical and family history. Questions from patients are an opportunity to explain how genetics is one part of the picture in causing the health condition and that lifestyle factors also contribute. Even though they cannot change their polygenic risk score, they can live a healthy lifestyle and reduce their likelihood of developing the condition. As with other genetic tests, polygenic risk scores have limitations. We know from heritability studies that polygenic variants identified through GWAS do not capture all of the genetic variants contributing to complex conditions. Therefore, a polygenic risk score is only measuring a portion of a person's total genetic liability. Another limitation is that, like other genetic studies, GWAS have predominantly included participants of European ancestry, so GWAS findings and polygenic risk scores have diminished utility in people from other ancestral backgrounds. Ongoing research will improve the accuracy of polygenic risk scores and their applicability to more diverse populations.